Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, God's word that we're considering today is the opening of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And even though the the whole letter itself is, of course, worth reading, Paul really gets to the point very quickly. And we're going to see that in just these first 10 verses. Of course, it's something just as relevant for us today as it was a couple thousand years ago, or we we wouldn't bother talking about it. So I'd like to start just by reading the opening greeting, the first five verses. He writes, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through a man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and of all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Pause there. Friends, the letter to the Galatians begins much like all of Paul's letters, which actually the way he starts a letter is just an adaptation of the style of the day. Okay, so he, he identifies himself first, he identifies who he's writing to, his recipients, and then he, he offers a greeting. Now here, he uses the, the common words of greeting like you would just say to anyone on the street when you came up to them, like you would just say hi, right? And he actually, he, he pairs both the, the common Greek and the common Hebrew words of greeting here. We see the Greek word charis, which means grace, and the Hebrew word of greeting shalom, which means peace. But he doesn't just say them. Like again, we would just say hi to someone on the street. He uses these words in a a new way with a twist that elevates them beyond their sort of idiomatic well wishes. He brings out the meaning of those words in a way unique to a Christian. He does this by directing the grace and the peace to his recipients, right? Grace to you and peace. And he identifies where they should expect these blessings to come from, right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't even stop there. Rather than than let readers draw their own conclusions or leave it like, okay, God says, grace and peace to you guys, hi and hello from God the Father, Uh, he makes it clear it's more than just well wishes. He describes exactly how God's grace grace comes to us and makes it clear that peace will be the result. In fact, it's the the central truth of Scripture that we all gather around. It's that that truth so amazing and and so profound that we struggle to express just how it affects us. And yet you can state what it is, obviously, so briefly and so simply. There's there's a lot of ways to put it, but Paul says here, it's simply the fact that, that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. I mean, that's it, right? Paul wished them grace and peace, and there's the grace. There's the undeserved love and kindness. We talked about that a bit last week, didn't we? Christ gave everything he had. He gave himself. And and why did he do it? For what did he do it? He did it because of our sins. Our sins, which were crimes against him, crimes against God himself, and and not the sort of unwitting, ignorant crimes, not minor technicalities. These were willful and intentional crimes against a God who's only ever loved us. And in the face of all that, Christ Jesus dies for us. He handed himself over to destruction so that we could be taken out of the evil age. 
And, and I, I want to say that that's not entirely a future occurrence. That's not entirely something we're just waiting to happen. We are rescued the moment faith comes to us. When we learn and when we trust this truth about Jesus and therefore about ourselves, we are rescued. We have eternal life. We become renewed. We are no longer a slave to the sinful self, but we are new in Jesus. Yes, we continue for a while to live in this world, but but we're not chained to it any longer. We're not a part of it. And we know that when, when this world ends, when this world dies, we're not going with it. Again, I say that nothing we have done, and this is, this is important, nothing we have done deserves this. In fact, again, we've, we've actively worked against it. And yet God did it anyway. That's the grace shown to us. And having that grace brings us the promised peace. We also kind of talked about this last week, didn't we? We know we are at peace with God himself because of the sacrifice of Christ. And we can be at peace ourselves with this this knowledge that our future is guaranteed. Because we know what we do about our eternity We no longer have to live this life as though these were the only days we have. We can take that that list of things I need to do before I die and just, you don't need it. Okay, they'd be cool to get to, but you don't need them. There's not a single thing you could put on that list that's going to bother you when you get to heaven because you didn't get to it. So many of the things that our our culture, our society tells us that we need to worry about day by day or chase after in our lives, they just become so unimportant when we know about the truth of our eternity. And so we have peace because of the grace. And as Paul says, states here at the start of the letter, this is all made more certain by the fact that it comes to us from God himself. It's directly from God. It's not some human agent, some human messenger who would, who would corrupt the message, who would ruin the message. Paul was not sent from men or by man, but by God himself. The words we read in our Bible every week in, in worship and at home during the week, They're not human words. They're God's message to us. That message, God's word, is our connection. The message is what brings us faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are forgiven fully and freely by no action of our own. That is what is called in the Greek the oiangelion, the good news or as we more commonly call it, the gospel. The grace, the peace that we we struggle to fully comprehend and that anyone who stood up here struggles to fully express its impact and its value, it all comes to us through this gospel message of salvation by God alone. There is no message that we could treasure more. There is nothing of greater value. It is what we have learned. It is what we believe. And it is what we must never let go of. And friends, that was exactly the problem in the Galatian region. Because after Paul finished his greeting, which we're going to see he deliberately loaded with some of those truths, He jumps directly into speaking to the people at those churches. And if you look at a lot of other letters that Paul writes, he he often goes from the greeting into some words of thanks or praise for the congregations that he's writing to. He says, you guys have done such a good job. I'm so thankful for you. It's so great that you're, you're staying so strong in Jesus. That is not how he continues here. 
picking up at verse 6. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another gospel at all. There are, however, some who are trying to disturb you by perverting the gospel of Christ. But if even we or an angel from heaven would preach any gospel other than the one we preach to you, a curse on him. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches to you any gospel other than the one you received, a curse on him. Am I now seeking the favor of people or of God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to gain the approval of people, I would not be a servant of Christ. What happened? What happened in Galatia? Paul started most of these churches personally, and he was taught from God himself. He taught them the truth. He taught them the good news of Jesus from his own mouth. He had, he had personally seen the joy in these people's lives as they learned of the grace and the peace that God had given them, of the freedom from the present evil age. How did it go so wrong so quickly? Well, for one, Paul was a missionary. And so after the congregation was started, he had to move on. He wasn't there anymore. And now word had reached his ears that the, these people he cared about so much, who had so proudly confessed their Savior before, had, had given up the certain truth because someone else said something a little different. And if you read through the whole letter of Galatians, which I highly encourage you to do, it seemed that we can, we can piece together what the problem was. It, it seems that there were, there were accusations against Paul, that, that what he came and talked to them about was really dumbing down the actual truth, kind of oversimplifying it to make it easier for people to accept it. And so, you guys, let me, let me, let me tell you about the real truth. Let me tell you the full thing that Paul should have told you about. The truth is, you need to believe in Jesus, and then you need to go back to following the Jewish laws and customs that God gave us, especially circumcision. That's a big one. God's real strict on that. You have to believe in Jesus, they would say, but then you had to do these other things in order to really be saved. Paul says this other gospel was no gospel at all, and of course it's not. That's not good news. That's like being told, hey, you're going to get a really big bonus at Christmas if we meet all our performance goals. I'm not going to tell you what they are. It's, it's saying, hey, I bought you a new car. I even financed it in your name. That's saying, yeah, I'm going to help you move this weekend. It's no trouble at all, but you owe me one. Those aren't, that's not good news. Those are trades. Those are transactions. It's not grace if you are responsible for part of it. It's not forgiveness if there's something you do to make it happen. And then that destroys the peace. How can you rest comfortably in salvation if you know that part of the solution depends on your action? You know better than anyone else how fallible you are. You'd either end up constantly terrified that you never did it right, or you might be delusional enough to think that you did it so right that God's got to be super proud of you. And God kind of owed you this favor of grace. Again, that's, that's not grace. That's a, that's a bargain. That's a deal. And I'm sure it started slowly because I'm sure there's some that thought small matters like this weren't really that big a deal. There were probably those that said, 
okay, sure, we'll be circumcised too if you say that's necessary. All right. Seems like a, a little thing, a small thing. But take a look again at Paul's reaction to the people who said these things. He says, if anyone, anyone preaches any gospel other than the true one, a curse on him. He doesn't just say it once. He says it twice. A curse on him. Not, I really hope he repents of his ways. Not, go to him and show him his error. No. For changing the gospel of Christ and chaining down souls with a message that is no gospel at all, Paul calls for consequences. This is not a small thing. Friends, knowing the truth of Jesus or not is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. If someone is teaching a message that leads to eternal death, I mean, what do you think the consequences should be for that? Now, obviously, this is not a problem localized to Galatia, or there wouldn't be a whole lot of point of talking about it this morning. If anything, the problem only is more pronounced today. How often have we seen it play out like Galatia on an individual level with someone? You ever seen that? Right? Someone is taught the truth of Jesus, maybe even raised in the truth of Jesus. They rejoice in that truth, in the good news of God. They love their Savior. They treasure the gospel. And then some circumstance of life keeps them away from the source of truth, like Paul was away from that congregation. And they hear another whisper in their ear. Maybe society puts pressure on that person to act like the rest of them. Maybe they're, they're off to college, influenced somewhere else, and all too suddenly they trade the truth that they love for a lie. Maybe a reasonable lie on the surface. It may be an appealing lie, but it's a lie. Whether it's a, another church body that teaches things that they want to hear or or giving in to that, that lie that we all have whispered inside of us that, that I am in control of my destiny and I can fix all my own problems and I can do and have what I want. There's all kinds of different ways that we can be led astray. And the results of, of being led away by these lies, they can, they can be distressing or they can be extremely grave. See, as soon as you change any part of the gospel truth, whether you do that in a church or, or just because you're trusting in yourself instead of God, as soon as you change that truth that it's entirely God saving you, your peace is forfeit. Just like we said, if even a small part of your salvation depends on you, then which is the part you think you're going to obsess and focus on? Are you really going to be looking to Jesus all the time? Or are you going to be thinking about that bit you have to do to make sure you are saved? At the very least, life becomes harder than it needs to be. I'm, I'm not going to say there's, there's no believers in congregations that teach other things. That, that would be silly. But it's not the peace they should have. And at worst, you lose faith in Jesus and you put faith in yourself. But again, sometimes it gets even worse as faith is abandoned entirely for the lie of the world. And eternal life is lost in the process. I don't have to tell you that that's not an outcome you want, right? Eternal life is the only thing that matters out of this life. It's the only thing you take with you. Don't let the possibility of this even come close to you. Be vigilant. Don't take God's grace and peace for granted so that this won't happen. 
I'm sure we've all seen it happen. I'm sure we've known people who've given up on God and they're lost. Friends, there is only one sure way to keep this from happening to you. You hold on to the gospel truth. You hold on to God alone as your source of truth. You hold on to his word as your source of truth. You keep that truth. You don't let anyone take it from you. You don't let anyone tell you a different truth. I'd like to elaborate a minute on how you do that, because it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. How do you make sure you are not led astray from the truth? Well, it seems to me, just, you know, spitting in the wind here, it seems to me, if you want to know the difference between the actual truth and something else you might be told, you need to know the truth pretty well so you can compare. Right? You need to know it inside out and backwards so that you cannot be deceived. You need to stand firm on what God says so that when someone else says otherwise, you know that's a lie. You can recognize it without a second thought. You have the truth at your fingertips. You all do. You probably got at least one printed copy at home, and I guarantee you, you get to it from every digital device you own. It's God's word. His word is where we hear the truth of our salvation. His word is where the only gospel is found. That is where we constantly return to hear the good news. And I'll let you in on a little secret that's really no secret at all. You don't know it well enough. None of us do. I know I don't. In fact, we don't even know the basics as well as we might like to think. There is always more of God's word to learn better. We never get to put a stamp on any part of it and say, okay, I know that, moving on, never have to go back there. Study it. Dig into it. Read it on your own. Use a commentary. Use a study guide to help you. If you're not sure what to start with, where to start, ask. Still get confused from from what you've read? You're not sure what's going on? Okay, that's what your pastor and your leaders are for. Maybe you're embarrassed to ask them. Guys, you can have my number too. Ask me for it, okay? I'll explain it. I've been through it a few times. And then, friends, gather with your brothers and sisters here. Study God's word together. Learn from each other's insights. Never think you're done learning. Never think you've learned any part of the Bible well enough that you're done. For one, you haven't. And for another, there is just too much literally at stake to make that assumption. The world is going to do everything in its power to tear the treasure of the grace and peace of God away from you and leave you holding a bag of garbage with a nice bow on it. And if you don't know what the truth looks like well enough, you may not even notice the switch has been made. Dig into the good news of God so that you will never be fooled into accepting any imitation. But even more than that, friends, this isn't homework, okay? Studying God's word isn't a hardship. It's a blessing. We are refreshed, renewed, and blessed every time we do it. Enjoy the blessings that pour out of the good news because that is what it really is. The better you, your understanding and your knowledge of the word of God the more you're going to just appreciate your life, the more you're going to appreciate the, his grace in your life, and the more complete your peace on this earth is going to be. If you've, if you've never actually committed yourself to studying God's truths every day, then you may not realize the, the regular comfort and joy that you're missing out on. God 
really does pour out continual blessings on those who listen to him regularly. Hear time and again about Jesus, who gave himself up for your sins and rose from the dead so that you could be rescued. Every day, listen with believing hearts to the one true gospel. Amen.